good evening. Let's stand together. If you can, let's do that. I want to read a few verses out of Psalms chapter 71 uh, this evening as we get started. Verse 19 through 23. The Bible says, Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high, who has done great things. These are good verses. O God, who is like unto thee? Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. I will also praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth, O my God. Unto thee will I sing with the harp, O thou holy one of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul which thou hast redeemed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we are grateful, Lord, for even that, so much in those verses, but even that last phrase, we're redeemed. And we're thankful for it, God. And I pray that that will result in us praising you tonight um, with our voices as we learn new songs and and sing songs that we do know already. I pray, Lord, that our heart would be to praise you, not just our lips, but our hearts. God, you want our hearts. And so I pray that you would help uh, Brother Stevens. He comes to lead and then our pastors. He opens the word here in just a moment uh, to bring us what you'd have for us. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing. We're going to sing Faith is the Victory, O Glorious Victory that Overcomes the World. Let's sing it out all together. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in veils below. Let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. We're going to learn another new hymn. This will make, I believe, number seven that we've learned this year. So that's exciting, right? Isn't that great? Number seven, number of completion. But we're not there yet. We're going to keep going. So this is, we're going to learn this one. So I'm going to sing the first verse and, uh, through for you. And then I'm going to have you join me in on the first verse again after we're done. All right. So listen to this song by faith. By faith we see the hand of God. In the light of creation's grand design, in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul. together again on that first verse. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. We will stand as children of the promise. and 
when justice reigns. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the church was called to go. In the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not. Amen on that last verse. Sing it out now. By faith the mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. That's our goal, walking by faith and not by sight. Let's sing, my Savior, first of all, lift it up. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. Oh, the soul-thrilling rapture when I view His blessed face. The luster of his kindly beaming eye. How my full heart will praise him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepared for me a mansion in the sky. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. of the nails in his hand. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come, and our parting at the river I recall. To the sweet vales of Eden, they will sing my welcome home, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know Stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages, I shall mingle with delight 
but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. Amen. Man, a quick missions update from last week, $4,301.10 was given. We'll bring our new total to date to $318,077.10. Just a reminder, you can give after the service or go online to ourroombaptist.com. Uh, we're going to pray and continue on with the service. Dear Father, we're so grateful to be able to come to your house once again this evening. And dear Lord, what a great message we heard this morning and just a reminder and a challenge, dear Lord, that Everything that happens in our life is, is on, on purpose and for the plan you have for us. And help us, dear Lord, to learn from those things and, and to be ready for the next challenge, the next trial, the next um, hill to climb, dear Lord. I pray you'd help us to stand strong, to stand firm, to, to, to carry the banner of you, dear Lord, and, and to show it to the, the rest of the world. Uh, I think for the missions, dear Lord, to help us to, to continue to give so others around the world might hear your gospel as well and pray for pastors that come still lord use him use your word in jesus name we pray amen Titus chapter 2, if you're able to stand in honor of the reading of God's word, Titus chapter 2, 
So we're dealing with gender confusion. I think this Sunday, next Sunday, I think we'll be done. And um, I'm going to read the first eight verses because it, we're going to specifically deal with really just one verse in the words, defining the words in the one verse. But I, I, I think the whole thing speaks to the whole. Uh, obviously, it's to, speaking to men and women. And so these are just characteristics that would be good. We're, tr- we're talking about helping the next generation. You know, what does God want us to be to make sure that we're passing along to the next generation what he desires them to learn? They get it from us. They got to get it from somewhere. And I promise you the world's going to be tenacious about what they're doing. And we need to be just as tenacious to make sure that they know what the truth is. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine... That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviors becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to save you. Father, I pray that you bless the reading of the Bible. And Lord, we're just going to define terms tonight and try to apply them. So I ask for your help. As I've already said, proclaimed in my heart to you, God, I cannot convince people, neither can I impress the heart. Lord, I can present truth. But it's you that's going to do the work, and I pray that you would. I pray that we'd be motivated, stirred up, Lord, to be exactly what the Bible tells us to be so that those that come up behind us know exactly what's expected according to the Bible. Not our standards, but what the Bible says. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Well, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, our value comes from... Those verses, who are we, male and female, we were created in the image of God in the form of a gender. And our gender is part of our creation, the image of God. Our society is very confused on these issues and they deeply desire to persuade the masses to their side. And it's deeper than a society. We know it's a satanic mindset moving and directing behind the scenes. We, we must cling to the Bible by faith no matter the current trends of the day. I mean, we, you know as well as I do that, that the mindset, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. And, and the Bible's making reference to a philosophy, a mindset. Do not fall in love with a mindset of the world. Don't do it. Guard yourself against it. Love the Lord God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. That's how you guard against the mindset of the world. You, you got to think according to the Bible. Genesis 127, again, was the beginning. I mean, it was male and female. They were 100% male, 100% female. And, and, and Romans chapter 1 is the end. The ultimate confusion, homosexuality. They're neither either one, fully male, fully female. And, and, of course, that's satanic. And along the way, again, society makes their choices and people personally make their choices. But we're primarily concerned with the, with the church. Where are we at? What is our mindset? And, and again, women, and godly women, church women, Christians, however you want to define them, they don't want to be lesbians and, and no, any more than the men want to be homosexual. But what the men want is less responsibility. And the ladies want, want what the men have. And so there's this pull and this tug inside of our hearts, again, not to be perverted, but just to be what we weren't designed to be. And every time that a man takes a step, even if it's a little step, then then he's part of the confusion of what a man is. And every time a woman takes a step to be what she was not designed to be, she takes a step and it confuses the genders and it confuses our world and they're confused enough and they ought to be able to look at the church and say, okay, well, what is right? What does the Bible say? So God's created us different on purpose that we'll be able to accomplish the goal. Ephesians chapter 5 reaffirms the Genesis teaching. We cannot be satisfied in life until we do it God's way. Genesis chapter 2, God had assigned Adam with some tasks and responsibilities. Adam was to make sure that 
He, they, they, his family lived under God's law and to cleave unto his wife, love her, cherish her, protect her. Adam is most satisfied when he takes the responsibilities God given him and protects his wife. When Adam just does what God designed him to do, he is the most satisfied in all the world. And Eve is the most satisfied and ladies and women are the most satisfied when they just do exactly what God designed them to do. We've got to learn that. We've got to figure that out. You can't do better than God's design. You just can't do it. He, he knows us. He, he, he made us. He designed us. And so a man confuses this when he fails to take the initiative or leadership role. And a woman confuses it when she, when she pulls back or resists receiving leadership or initiative or protection from the man. So we talked about the spirit of the man. The garden involved work. There's much to do. It took some effort. So the man had to have some aggression, some initiative, some fight inside of him. Adam had to have these in order to get things done that needed to be done. Men were designed to, be, to, to want to be in charge. And God wasn't going to come down every day and, with a to-do list. Adam just needed to take initiative. So God's put this drive inside of man. And so we, we began to talk about the image of God. And, and it means to shade or a resemblance or a representative figure why is the image of God so important to God? Because we're his representatives. There are characteristics about God that we can learn from women because they are representatives of God in their gender. There are characteristics about God that we can learn from men because we're representatives of God in certain areas. And so God's a balanced God and, and God knows how to communicate and reveal himself to us. He's that in creation. He's done it in salvation. He's that in the word of God. But he also did it in mankind. We're part of creation. God created genders. He, he created male and female. And by the way, do not let the world confuse you on this. And I know there's exceptions to the rules. Well, I read where there was a, there, there was a, a, a guy or a girl, whatever the case is, was born with both sexes. Well, that, okay, okay. But that, doesn't that prove the rule? That that's an exception? I mean, most human beings, and, and again, I'm not being unkind to someone that has suffered in this way. I'm not. But most human beings are born with two hands and two arms and two legs and two feet. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty normal. So when one is born without an arm, isn't that an abnormality? In other words, it proves that that's an exception. That's not what's normal. And so, again, we, we can make those arguments, and that's another sermon but the point is just don't let the world confuse you that God said in the beginning, male and female. That's what he did. So there's ladies that, that, that the ladies have qualities, tenderness and compassion and impatient. And there's a side to God that we're able to get a glimpse of because of the image of God shown through the women. God is perfectly balanced as much as he's tender and compassionate and patient. He's also mighty and fierce and just and strong. And so it's important for us to carry out our proper roles in order that we can more fully see God. And as much as a man wants to battle and adventure and rescue, a lady wants to be fought for and wanted and needed. And, and I know this society has changed. I know the mindset's changed. But as a general rule, God designed it this way. What can we learn about God? Well, as, as much as a man wants to battle, he's got a fight inside him. He's got initiative inside of him. The ladies, they, they want to be fought for. They want to be wanted. They want to be needed. What can we learn? Well, God wants to be recognized. God he wants to be chosen. He wants to, his creation to acknowledge him. God has created beings that worship him. That's true. But he wanted to be chosen. So he will get the glory. What joy it brings to his heart when we choose him just because of who he is, just because we love him. We learn that from the characteristics of, of these women and ladies, and the way God designed them, God's revealing something to us. Everything God designed is on purpose. He's communicating something. And we just got to pay attention and learn. And so I close with the illustration about a person in my family that was uh, tried to commit suicide, tried to overdose, cut her own wrists. My mom had tried to witness to her, share the gospel with her. Her response was, I don't know if I can trust anybody including God. And so she was, she was born out of wedlock and uh, didn't, didn't, her parents didn't want her. And, and so she was raised by grandparents and, and, and really a, a life of immorality and rebellion. And, and when asked the root of her problems, the core of your struggles, she looked with tears in her eyes and said, I just want my dad to love me. So I want you, I want you to think about that. So, so sir, 
husband, dad. I don't think we clearly understand the importance of our role as men. I know what the average sitcom does and says. I know usually the dad's the bozo on the couch that doesn't know anything, can't fix anything, has no answers to anything. I understand that's the way we're perceived. And I understand that the world wants the masculinity to be toxic. You can't be what you are. The world wants to tear that down and they, they want to feminize us. They do. That's what's transpiring in our culture. But can I tell you that God has a plan and a purpose and everything he does is in perfect balance. And so he's got this, this compassionate side, this tender side, this, this female side. That I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about the way he created us, male and female, genders. He's got this one side and, and it's important that that's represented who is God? What is he like? Well, this is part of what God is. And on the other side, this is how God is. He's both. He's strong. He's a fighter. He's a man of war. I mean, God is a man. Those qualities exist inside of him. Of course, in perfection. But if we have sons or daughters, we carry great responsibility. We're the trainers. We're the... We're to be equipping them to serve the Lord. We're to be equipping them to go out and produce a godly seed first and foremost. And I can back that up with the Bible, Malachi chapter 2 and verse 15. And did he not make one? He's making reference to marriage. Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? Why did God create marriage? That he might seek a godly seed. That's the first thing he mentioned. There's a lot of benefits to being married. Absolutely. Companionship. And yes, there's offspring. That, that's part of it. And, and yes, there's friendship and, and love. And yes, there's a lot of benefits. But the primary thing that God said, look, the reason I created this is because I want an offspring. I mean, children are heritage of the Lord. I mean, we don't get that in our minds because we're so possessive and we think they're ours. Your children are not yours. We steward what is God's. I, I was at that, that trip last week in, in, in Montana, and I was talking to a church planner, and I was trying to be a blessing to him. And I don't remember what I did. I, one of the things I tried to do is, is buy a supper, and he's like, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a case. I don't want freebies. And I'm, so, I'm really sorry that you feel that way. Because his church is struggling and his finances are struggling. And I, I found that out. He wasn't whining. I just found that out. And I just knew that our church would want to be a blessing to him. Let, let me do that. Let our church love on you. We, we can do that. And, and, he, and, and he, he made the comment, well, I'm not a project. I don't want to be a project. And I said, no, 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 no. Hang on a second. I don't have any money. Ardenor Baptist Church doesn't have any money. It's God's money. It's a whole lot easier for me to spend somebody else's money than my own. Is that not the truth? You know why we cling to our finances? Because we think it's ours. But, but when we understand that everything I have is God's, and God says, look, I want you to be a blessing to this family. Give them a love offering. Hey, when you're giving somebody else's money away, give it away. It's not a problem. The reason it's so hard to let go is because we think it's ours. It's the same thing with our children. They're not ours. We steward. This earth is the Lord's. Everything about it is the Lord's. We're the Lord's. We've been bought with a price. We just steward life. We don't own it. These are not our bodies. It's been purchased with a price. We don't do with our bodies what we want. They're God's. It's the same thing with everything. We're stewards of our children. So you get to chapter 2 in Titus and he, in, in verse 2 in particular, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. So in other words, what he's saying is, look, you, you that are mature, when you say the age, it doesn't mean old, it just means you that are mature. Here's some qualities that are important. In other words, these are qualities... Now, I think as a general rule, an, over, an overview, yes, they're qualities of Christianity... But he's speaking specifically to the men. So these are qualities that he wants the men to have. And yes, women need them too, but we're talking about men. And he uses the word sober. Sober means circumspect. Looking on all sides 
to be cautious, examining carefully all the circumstances that may affect a determination or a measure to be adopted. In other words, what he's saying is, is you need to be sober. You, you need to be level-minded. You, you need to think things through. You, you need to respond, not react. You know the difference? You, you need to check out all sides. Dad, husband, sir, whatever place you find yourself in, you're supposed to be sober-minded. We're, we're supposed to, before we make decisions, we're supposed to, I mean, if, if i got to make a decision about this monitor, i, I got to check out the whole thing. i got to look on all sides. I, I mean, why? Well, and I'm just making this up as I go, the, this part. But, but what if I look at this, this monitor and say, well, I like the size of it. I like the color of it. I think it'll work. Well, what if I don't have the plug in for it? You make a mistake. And, and so the Bible's simply saying, look, when, before you make decisions, sir, and I'm talking, and we're, we're, making, we're making references to being a man. We're making references to being a dad. We're making references to being a husband. Before you make a decision, consider all sides. We're to be careful with every decision concerning our own personal lives and our families and our wives and our children that the outcome will be the very best concerning every point. And, and, and I just threw a couple of illustrations. You take social media, for instance. And, and don't get mad at me because I don't know who has a phone and who doesn't. I'm just trying to illustrate something. And just because I do it a certain way doesn't mean everybody has to do it that way. That, I, I wouldn't want that. I want you to follow the Lord. I want you to follow Jesus, not me. Unless I'm doing right. But the point is, you take social media and, and, and boy, there's this, this pressure from society to make sure that our kids keep up with everybody else. That they have what everybody else has. And they do what everybody else does. And well, they have a phone and they've got TikTok and they've got, they've got Instagram and they've got all these things. Okay, Dad, before you hand your 10-year-old a phone and give him an Instagram account, consider all the sides. Amen. Consider the influences. I, I'm, I, I, and again, I'm not up here to try to make arguments about social media or phones with 10-year-olds. I don't know who has them and who doesn't, so don't, this is not personal. But I don't understand why a 6-year-old's got to have a phone. I don't get that. I was a grown man before I had a phone. And I still don't want one. What, what could possibly be so important to an eight-year-old that they got to lay in bed at night and get on social media? That everything that's coming through that screen is going through their eyeballs, into their brain. Everything they're hearing through their ears is going to their brain. It's affecting the way they think. And, and I, again, th this is a far less influence. And if you come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, God bless you. You're sure that's what the Bible says. But, but if you come to church three times a week, maybe three 30-minute sermons or Sunday school. I mean, if you're really a fanatic and, and you go to Sunday school too, you possibly have two hours of teaching in a week. You could do that on social media in one evening. Uh, and again, this is not a message about social media. I'm just saying we, we have got to pay attention to what the world is doing and, and, and the way they, they, they sink their claws into our families. So, Dad, before you make a decision, be sober about it. Make sure you think it through. Make sure you looked at every angle, every possible influence, and then make your decision. That's all the Bible's saying. Well, everyone's seen this particular movie, and, and so I hear it's really good. I hear it's really funny. Well, did you research it? Don't go by what somebody else says. You research it. You look into it. You pull that plugged in and see how many words it has and how many scenes it has and how many times the parents are rebelling or the teenager rebels to the parents. Say, so, well, what's the big deal? It's a big deal because when a child watches that and says, well, that must be the way kids act with their parents. I'm just telling it's influence. I don't, I'm not fanatical. We, we have pizza and a movie night. At, we try to every Friday night. We've watched a lot of movies through the years. I'm not against movies. There are trends of the day. But is, is that trend molding the heart of your child towards the things of God? I mean, 
and, and, and it's common. And the Bible even says in the last days, parents are going to be, our children are going to be disobedient to their parents. Those are listed with some pretty vile sins. It's not a compliment. It's not saying that children are disobedient to their parents. And it's a wonderful thing. It's just the, it's just the way things are in the end times. That is not what the Bible's saying. The Bible's saying that this is something that's, that's horrendous. Well, I know, but disrespect and throwing a fit, it's just kind of normal parent-child relationship. It might be in the world, but it's not supposed to be in the church. It's not supposed to be in the family of God. Now, parents, I'm for you. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Consider every angle. Where does what you're doing lead to? And I'm going to get into details in a minute. But what are we teaching our sons and daughters? The, the type of spirit to have. Have an excellent spirit. Let no man despise that you, but be that an example of a believer in word and conversation, charity and spirit, and faith and purity. And what kind of child do you want? Because you know as well as I do, there's children in the world you want to be around. There's children in the world you don't want to be around. And we're not talking about your grandkids and somebody else's grandkids. We're talking about the spirit of a child. Honesty, integrity, modesty, responsibility, a proper work ethic. I, I'll never forget, there, there was a couple of times that I, I, I was a pretty level-headed kid. I was pretty easy to get along with. I was obedient. Ask my mom. Um, I know you think, what happened? I don't know what happened, but back in the day, I was decent. And... And so, but I, I remember a couple of times that my dad did something. I could, I could have lost my mind. And one of them was, I mean, we, when I say dated, I never dated. I mean, I'm talking about, when I, when I talk about dated, I'm talking about writing a note. Or possibly if it got really serious, I went over to their house and like watched TV with the family in the living room. And that got really serious. And so this was a pretty serious relationship because I was going to go over and watch a movie with her family. I'm senior in high school. And uh, so my dad, I mean, my whole life, dad was associate pastor. And so it just, you'd have to be raised in my home to understand. But my whole life, everything was put off on John. Let John and his boys do it. Let, let John and his boys do it. I mean, so we moved people. We went and fixed their flat tires. I mean, we, I mean, we, it was a constant thing of call John, <laughs> call John. And, and we lived across the street from the church. And so, you know, if somebody couldn't mow the lawn, get John and his boys to do it. You know, and it, and it was a great life. I didn't know any better. I mean, it, we, we just did a lot of things. And so on this particular outing, there was a gentleman in our church that was replacing the roof on his ranch house. Did you understand what I'm saying, ranch house? It's not his house. It's a ranch house. It's out in the country. It's out on a ranch. What's the big deal? And so we, we went out there and tore the roof off, and, and we were putting the new roof on. And it was the end of the day, and I, I, I got to go because I got a date. And, and so we, we, we get all the way to the top, and so they start cleaning up while I did the ridge line. I don't know if that's what you call it, but that's what I'm going to call it, the very top. And so and it, it wasn't that big of a house, and it was just a kind of this A. I don't know what you call that, but kind of like an A is super easy. Go up, ridge line, out of there. And so I put the ridge line on, and I mean, all the tools were put up. I put the last shingle on, drove the last nail in, and I, and I holster my, my hammer. You know, I'm out of there. And uh, my dad gets back up on the roof, and he's like, take it off and redo it. Does dad not know I have a date? Does dad not know I got something going on? And I'm like, and I, and I, I mean, in our house, you didn't question, you didn't, I mean, I just, I'm not throw you off the roof. I mean, I, I just, so I just was like, okay. He goes, it's crooked as a dog's back leg. I'll never forget. It's crooked as a dog's back leg. We're not doing that. Tear it off and redo it. And guess what I did? <laughs> I told, well, what was dad doing? Dad wasn't mad at me. Dad wasn't trying to make my life miserable. Dad was trying to teach me something. Son, if you're going to do it, do it right. Well, what are we teaching our kids? All I'm saying is you, you got to walk around the circle. You, you got to look at every angle. You got to, before you make a decision, Dad, consider it. Consider the whole thing. Their attitude, fidelity, priorities. A friend of mine is a pastor and, 
had a family racing motorcycles on Saturday, and so they would race on Saturdays and load up and then drive home on Sundays. And, and this went on for several weeks, and he finally told them, he goes, you know what you need to do? You need to pack up and drive home Saturday night. You need to be in church on Sunday. And they're like, like, what? We race motorcycles on Saturday. That's what we do. And, and he just posed the question, well, what if I did something on Saturday night and came back on Sunday? That's a fair question. Because when I read the when I, when I read the instructions of the church about church attendance, that ain't written to the pastor. That's written to the body. Now, it's quiet in here, and I'm sorry, but I'm telling you, you got to teach your kids priorities. You, you got to walk around the whole circle. And, and, and the decision that I'm going to make today, it, I can't just survive the moment. As dads, we cannot survive the moment. What we have to do is consider the cost and look down the road. And the decision I make today, how is that going to affect them tomorrow? The decision I make today, how is that going to affect their future? The way they think about life and the way they think about God and the way they think about the things of God. I've got to decide today, not just a moment. And by the way, all of us survive moments. Every single one of us do. We all do that from time to time. We're trying to get through the day. I get it. Spiritual truths and the application of the Bible in everyday life. Have you ever asked your children who wants to go first or, or which one do you want when it comes to choosing first slice of pizza? Have you ever done that Friday night? I'm not going to say which kid it was. I don't want to embarrass them. But Friday night we had dessert. And it's, uh, and by the way, by the way, if you go to uh, Papa Murphy's, go to Papa Murphy's and get the s'mores bars. All it is is cookie dough. You got to add some chocolate chips on top and, and, and marshmallows because they don't put near enough. But if you add some chocolate chip and marshmallows on top and then put it in, whatever it says to cook it for, pull it out a little early. If you like gooey cookie dough, if you do, I'm telling you right now, it'll change your life. Try it. It'll change your life. If you don't like it, come tell me. I'll, I'll give your six bucks back. I'm telling you, it'll change your life. Anyway, so we had dessert, s'mores bars from Papa Murphy's. They came out of the oven and I sliced them. And, uh, and, and just so happened, I didn't, I didn't count right. And so the, the slices were off. And so there were some very large ones and some not so large ones. And so the first child came in. I thought, you know, usually, usually we do it in a certain order. And I thought, we're going backwards tonight. So I, I said, which one do you want? And they picked the biggest one in that thing. So I served it up, put it on their plate. And I said, thank you for doing what Jesus would do. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Well, I'm just trying to tell them, hey, prefer one another. Think about somebody else. I'm not trying to be unkind. He uses the word grave. It just means honorable or honest or, or venerable or worthy of reverence, respect. And again, I, I want to say this, that no parent is perfect. If you're a child, a teenager, a young adult, whatever the case, I don't care how old you are. I don't care how good your parents are, how bad your parents are. There's no perfect parent. It's impossible. But how children love their parents and desire to lift them up until we give them a reason to lose respect. And the Bible's simply saying, sir, look, a quality that you need to have is, is you, you need to have a, a graveness about you. You, you need to have a, a, a life that demands respect. Not perfect, but the decisions you make, the way you live your life, the attitude that you portray. Don't give a reason to disrespect. Do, do you remember, and I don't want this to come across negative because I don't mean it to be, but do you remember growing up how, I hope you had this, I hope you had this, how you thought that dad was the biggest and the baddest and the strongest and, the, I mean, they Hey, nobody, nobody could whip my dad. Nobody. Do you ever remember thinking that? Just, I'm just curious. I, I hope that was a quality you had. I hope, I hope you did. If you, if you missed that, I hate that for you. Because I did. I thought, man, my dad, I mean, he's, he's bad. He's bad to the bone, you know. And now I've come to some more educated conclusions concerning my dad's physical proudness. But I still think he's a wonderful husband to my mom and father to my siblings and myself and grandfather to his grandchildren. 
My mom or dad, neither one, ever gave me a reason not to respect them. Were they perfect? No, nobody is. But they never made any major decisions. They, they never pulled anything major that I could look at them and say, man, I, I wish they wouldn't have done that. And that's what the Bible's saying. Dad, make decisions. Live your life. Treat your spouse. Treat the things of God in such a way that your children say, I respect that. I may not always agree with it, but boy, I respect it. I did not like my dad making me redo that roof line that night. I'm telling you, I was infuriated. But I respect him. In fact, when I think back about it, if he'd have said, it's just a ranch house, who cares? I'd have probably been disappointed in the years to come. That night, that moment, I'd have been happy. But I look back on it and said, man, I wish my dad would have made me do that right. You understand? I hope I never give my children a reason not to think less than honorable, have reverence for and respect for me. We all know it takes so long to build something, yet one moment to tear it all down. One decision. We're one decision away from ruining everything that we built. you got to be grave. It's why we have to stay in the Bible and keep praying and keep walking with the Lord and gain strength from his presence. Because the enemy is constantly releasing fiery darts to deceive and trick and trip us up. Constantly. You're talking about somebody that's ferocious. You're talking about somebody that's tenacious. The enemy is. And we ought to be just as tenacious to say, I will not. By God's grace, I'm not going to give my kids a reason. Temperate, self-controlled. When dealing with spilt milk or wrecked cars... When watching television, when driving in traffic, when working on a project and things don't go as planned, when talking about someone in church, the amount of time we spend on something, dad, that could be a phone or that could be watching sports, what we watch or look at or think on, temperate, self-controlled. It says sound in faith. It just means to, to be well, uncorrupted, to be true in doctrine, unmovable in other words, unmovable. Know what you believe. What does the Bible say? That's a characteristic that is important to a man. Know what you believe. Because I'm telling you, it's going to be challenged how many parents have you seen stand firm on issues until their child is of the age that those convictions get put to the test? No, no, I mean, I've seen, I'm not being critical. But that principle is good and it's right and it's good for your kid. And you got two-year-olds at home. But then your two-year-old turns 12. And all of a sudden we begin to shift our convictions and our principles because they don't fit our family anymore. No, no, sir, the Bible doesn't change. We don't adjust biblical principles. We stand firm on them. We be kind, we're kind about it and, and, and we're gracious about it, but you can't bend that book. We need to realize what we stand for and stand. A conviction is something you'd die for. Brother Hardy tells a story of when his son was becoming distracted. He was dating a girl. In fact, it's the a, it's a woman he married. They've been married 30-something years, have three wonderful children. It all turned out fine, okay? Don't get mad at him. But he gives this illustration. You may disagree. That's fine. But he gives this illustration where his son was dating this girl, and, and uh, they were looking at each other across the youth room to the point they weren't getting, I mean, his, his son was trained. Look, you go in the youth room and you minister to somebody else. When a guest comes in, you, you greet them. And so he would go and observe. And it happened more than one time. It wasn't a one and done. But it happened more than one time that he, he'd go in the youth department. His son was over there talking to his girlfriend, not paying a lick of attention, anything going on around him. And there was guest in there and his son wasn't paying attention. So he'd tell him, son, you, you got to cut that out. Cut it out or you're going to be done with her. And I don't know how many times, knowing Brother Hardy, it wasn't very many. He went back there and he wasn't 
doing what he told him to do. So when they went home that day, he said, you got one hour to go spend time with her and say goodbye. You're done. And, and he said his son looked at him like, well, what if that's not what I want to do? He says, well, that's, what, that's the way it's going to be. And if you don't like it, you can pack your bags. And so he went and said goodbye. And, and by the way, they worked out. They got married and it's all well. But the point is, his desire was to raise a son who served God first. Because if he would serve God first, he would love his wife the way she needed to be loved. How much better off are our children would be if dads would love their children enough to train them to be godly seeds. To be concerned about the end more than the moment. He uses the word charity, agape, love, affection, benevolence. Husbands, love your wives. The best thing, I've heard this all my life, the best thing you can do for your children is love their mama. I don't understand the psyche behind all the details of the parent's relationship, but this I do know, the better the parent relationship, the more security it gives a child. I do know that. And, and agape love is seeking their best, their highest good. Decisions we make with our children sometimes are for our best interest, not theirs. If we do this or that, it might upset them or it might even make our spouse upset, but therefore we cave into their desires in order to keep peace when it's not in their best interest. Look, for 23 years, my oldest is 23, for 23 years I've battled with discerning what is best. It's tough. It's hard. And I'll tell you why. Because I want a relationship with my kids. I'm just, I'm, I want them to like me. I want to get along. I want to go to bed and everybody's happy. But this is what I know. I'm their parent before I'm their friend. And if I will parent them, I can be friends with them someday. And there's many decisions that I, I mean, that, but kids don't understand the pressure they put on parents. It's brutal at times. Because I'm looking at my son or my daughter and I know what I'm going to say is fixing to make them mad. And I hate it. But there's something inside of me that says, no, I'm supposed to help them. I'm supposed to teach them. I'm supposed to train them. I'm supposed to help them make better decisions. And that's not right. And we're not going to do that. It's that delayed reward. Parent first, enjoy friendship later. Children spell love time. It takes time to listen. It takes time to understand. It takes purpose. It takes time to influence and to teach and to discipline. It takes time to have fun. Have, have you ever noticed how much work fun is? I played tennis with my kids Friday. I'm in so much pain today. My legs hurt so bad. They have no idea what they did to me. Besides the fact I had to go buy another tennis racket and more tennis balls. And then when we went to play tennis, I had to pay to play tennis. No, no, let me rephrase that. I had to pay to chase balls for three hours. What kind of world are we living in? That was painful. But I'm supposed to love them. And it takes time. The last word he uses is patience. It just means patient continuance. So often we don't allow our children to be children. What do you mean by that is children are children. I mean, we want the benefit of them, but we don't want to put up with the nonsense. Well, can I just tell you, children are going to be children? They're going to be loud sometimes. And by the way, there's got to be a place they can be loud. We love the benefit without embracing the responsibility so often. There are times we all want to give in. I, I mean, you go through potty training. Anybody remember that? How, how long could this take? How many messes you got to clean up? Where can you sell children? Transitioning to baby food. I don't know. I'm OCD. That, that was horrendous for me. 
That was awful. And God gave me seven to go through it because he was trying to teach me something. I can't stand messes. I can't stand messes. I hate messes. And when you, try, when you transition a baby, you don't remember feeding green peas that stink? They look terrible. They look like somebody, never mind. And, 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 and they, 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 you put it in their mouth. I mean, I'm, I'm making it real neat. And they lick it all over their faces. And they slobber it. And then they wipe their, and it gets all, I mean, it drove me insane. I got to where I duct taped them down. I didn't really. I didn't really. I wanted, I dreamed of this. Duct taping their head. You know, they can't move it. Their hands down. And saying, listen here, pal. In the mouth only. You spit it out, you don't get any more. I never, I never did it, but that's why I wanted a parent. I just said, that stuff drove me crazy. You know the awkward years of in between? <laughs> they're not teenagers, but they're not really kids anymore. And they're... I mean, they, 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 usually they have a body of an adult, but they have a brain of I don't know where it came from. Do, do you remember how... They, you, you don't remember. Let, let me sit down with you sometime and remind you. Teenagers, college age where they have far too much knowledge and not enough experience. They get one semester under their belt and all of a sudden they think they, you know, they could run the world. And I'm just saying children need the quality of continuing patience. By the way, so does your marriage. This is not applying just to kids. This is applying to life. By the way, so do your brothers and sisters in Christ. Be patient. But in reference to the family, children have so much to say and we have no time or desire to hear it. They hear from us when we've lost our patience. They hear from us when they do something wrong. I can't believe you. I wonder where my cousin would be if her dad had some of these qualities. If men were living as designed by the creator and women living as they were designed. I'm just wondering where our marriages would be. Where our homes would be. Where our churches would be. I don't think America would be in the shape she's in. If these were the qualities in our life. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Brother Stephen's going to come and lead us in an invitation. If the Lord spoke to your heart, I want to invite you to come. Kneel where you're at. Come to the altar. Whatever the case is. But a church, we, we cannot... If all we do with Scripture is say, I understand what it says, but we don't obey what it says, the Bible says we deceive ourselves. We begin to think more of ourselves than we are. God did not give us knowledge to simply acknowledge it. He gave it to us to act on it. Father, help us. And I know primarily it was to dads, to the home. The application was, but certainly it applies to every part in life. Every person, Lord, it is written to Christians. It's directed at men. God, the world looks at the brokenness of the home and they don't find any hope in it. So they go create their own with their own philosophy, with the world's philosophy. And it's destructive, it doesn't work. So God, help us to be men of integrity, men of the Bible, that we know what it says, we know what it means, and we live it out. God, help us to be right in our gender, in our image, that we bear of you. In, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Lord spoke to your heart. The altar's done. Brother Stephen's going to sing. You can sing along with him. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless. 
every Saturday at 10 a.m. Joy is this Tuesday. If you have any questions about that, see Miss Trina. Good News Club, they need some help. Sign up sheets out at the ministry desk. And uh, Brother Reuben got to go home this afternoon, which is just, I mean, seriously, almost a mir miraculous. I mean, from Wednesday to today, just the improvement was really an answer to prayer. And so we rejoice with them that he's able to go home. Long time to recover. Have some challenges ahead of him, but he at least got to go home. So praise the Lord for that. And then Miss Lawana. It's Miss Luana's birthday. She caught me in the parking lot and said, why didn't you say something about my birthday? <laughs> and that's not totally the truth. I mean, uh, but it was pointed out to me. Brother, Brother Cody's not here. He's the one that looks and gives me the little sticky note every Sunday, and he's not here. And so we we sorry that we failed to announce that this morning. So we're going to make up for it tonight. Miss Luana, happy birthday. She really is a precious lady. Been here a long time. How many years have you been here? 44 years. That's, that's a long time. And uh, I'll tell you, why don't you come close this in prayer? I'm kidding. I'm k <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. So happy birthday. She deserves a, a good day. So make sure you get by and greet her. Happy birthday. Brother Hodges, would you come up here and dismiss us, please, sir? I like to call people up here so people can hear. Sometimes people stand around in awkward silence like, are they done praying? So we're just trying to fix that. Thanks, Brother Hodges. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this message. We ask that you would help us to apply it to our lives, that we would be the parents and children that we should be. And we pray that you will bring us back here Wednesday evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.